Our fifth speaker of the day serving leadership positions from Lieutenant to Brigadier General in armored and cab formations across the United States and Europe. He has combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Brigadier General Matthew Van Wagenen. Good afternoon, warfighters. It's a great privilege and an honor to present at this conference. Thanks to the Maneuver Center of Excellence and Major General Pat Donahoe for putting this conference together despite all of the challenges of COVID this year. Every year, we look forward to the Maneuver Conference. It is no doubt the U.S. Army's premier platform for discussions about warfighting and our profession. As General Funk would say in his Funk Fundamentals, which is number two on his list, if you can't talk, you can't win. Of course, he is spot on. And in this information-saturated world we live in, it is vital that we share and discuss emerging ideas, threats, and opportunities to stay relevant and ready. The focus of my presentation, as you can see from the title, is to discuss strategic, strategic lethality and make the case that the key to unlocking unlimited potential across the allied enterprise is multinational interoperability. I am providing a view from over here working in NATO. I've spent a large part of my career working in Europe with our partners and allies. As we have made plenty of progress over the years, but there is still a lot to do, I believe we need to have greater focus on interoperability challenges as they exist today. We need to work harder on our battle networks, connecting our sensors to shooters and speeding up our kill chain. I use the word strategic lethality, but to be clear, this does not sit alone in our most senior levels. I believe this topic is applicable to all levels, to include our most junior NCOs and our officers. I am sure many of you out there listening in may find yourselves coming over to support operations and exercises in the Baltics and the Black Sea region, supporting United States Army, Europe, and NATO. This topic also applies to our industry partners, research labs, and think tanks. Many of you out there are working hard to improve our modernization, our weapon systems. But we need to think about how all the components interact to connect into our battle networks and to streamline our kill chains. How do they connect and share data in a multinational partnered environment? Going forward, I think the level of conductivity with our allies and partners is critical. As General Milley stated not long ago when visiting the United States Army Europe, it is our network of allies and partners that serves as a centerpiece for modern deterrence. First, I would like to give an update on the NATO Allied Rap Rapid Reaction Corps, as well as LANCOM and the United States Army Europe. I'd also like to go over the aspects of the strategic environment and the threats we are facing, followed by the opportunities for the Alliance and how we might think differently about interoperability to improve our ways of operating and fighting. I'll close with some challenges, highlighting things we need to continue to work on and make a plug for an emerging wargaming capability that is beginning to make a difference inside of NATO. In the end, I hope you will walk away with some new thoughts on interoperability and how it directly links to our ability to be more lethal. The NATO Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, the ARC, is the United Kingdom's largest deployable high readiness land headquarters. It is a unique high readiness headquarters with it falling under direct operational command of the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe during peacetime. A particular strength of this command is that it can deploy under United Kingdom direction with or without an Article 5 declaration. Here at the ARC, we are helping our partners and allies build muscle memory into large-scale warfighting. A lot of hard work and planning goes into ensuring high readiness and resilience. We are focused on developing lethality and the speed of action to ensure we have the ability to destroy as much of an enemy force with minimum economy of force as possible. This is essential in warfighting and the types of concepts we fight with, the way we organize, and even the way we communicate it makes a critical difference. Another key focus at the ARC is our ability to command and control 
with agility. Agile C2 is about distributed networks, minimizing our digital footprint, and ultimately integrating a complex sensor and shooter network that accelerates the speed of our collective kill chains across the Alliance. We spend lots of time and energy to have the Agile C2 required for a modern and complex battlefield. There is still a long way to go to get this right. For the third bullet on this slide on NATO resilience, this global crisis we are experiencing makes the idea of resilience ever more important. Survival and security require cooperation and collaboration across our alliance. The ARC and all the nations represented within it are always looking to improve cooperation to ensure our collective defense and our resilience remain on point for NATO. We will not allow this present crisis or the challenges to paralyze action. The commanding general here, General Sir Edward Smith Osborne, is adamant that we continue to operate despite the challenges of this current pandemic. We are leaning forward to operationalize the headquarters to make it proactive and not simply responsive. With our high readiness and our agile C2 systems, our headquarters can operate in modular C2 packages. We can capitalize on resilient networks and conductivity to recognize problems early, to increase the speed of recognition, the speed of decision making, and the speed of assembly. We will not help deter war if we can't demonstrate our preparedness to fight and fight together. NATO Land Command, commonly referred to as LANCOM, commanded by Lieutenant General Roger Cloutier, based in Izmir, Turkey, is our higher headquarters, focused on readiness, interoperability, standardization, and the validation of capability amongst all our NATO allies. This is an important and quite possibly an underappreciated aspect of warfighting. The standardization agreements and four standards dictate how we will operate and fight as an alliance inside of NATO. I'm sure many of you out there might not have heard of these references, but I will come back to them later in this brief. The United States Army Europe has plenty going on right now. Lieutenant General Christopher Cavoli and USER have really shaken things up in the European theater with a Defender series of exercises that started this year. On this slide, you can see just a few of the named exercises associated with Defender, Dynamic Front, Swift Response, and Sabre Guardian. USER and NATO are working together to synchronize these efforts as much as possible to achieve greater effects and build operational capacity across the European defense enterprise. It is not always easy, and there are always competing national priorities and regional challenges that must be worked through. By getting these things done, for example, Defender Europe 20 achieves 70% of its objectives in the midst of a pandemic. The most important objective of returning an armor division to Europe with its own equipment and demonstrating strategic readiness. And some units flowed into the theater to drop pre-positioned stocks. These are things that have not been exercised in many years in Europe. The United States Army Europe is now fo focused on building its capacity to fight as a land component command for Europe. Recently, V Corps was, was stood back up with its forward headquarters and will be located in Poland. 41st Field Artillery Brigade is coming back online as well as a theater fires command. There is also more experimentation and growth with the multi-domain task force as they integrate into exercises and continue to experiment in contact. The defense posture is shifting and expanding in new directions, and so is the strategic environment. This slide depicts the strategic environment and threat picture as we see it from this side of the Atlantic with our partners and allies. Our security challenges and threats have not changed, and if anything, are further compounded by the present pandemic. What you see on the slide is a kaleidoscope of contextual challenges that currently exist in Europe. If you were to speak to any NATO leaders, they would share a perspective that probably would not surprise most of you. They are focused on Russia, the terrorist threat, and the impact of refugees and migration, and the relevance of the alliance in tackling these array of challenges and threats. I will highlight three things as they apply to strategic lethality. They are highlighted in red on the slide. They are the institutional dynamics in Europe, the technological disruption, and the evolving threat. First, institutional dynamics to be mindful of. There's a rapidly approaching UK exit from the European Union, known as Brexit. Although a deal was reached, the commercial and financial impacts of this international breakup will not come until the end of this year. 
This, on top of the challenges of COVID-19, will surely have a massive impact to the UK and the EU on the security environment. Second, technological disruption will clearly affect the way nations fight. Militaries will have limited freedom of movement given the proliferation of sensors and precision shooters. Advances in artificial intelligence will increase the use of intelligence systems and the speed of the battlefield will change. Third, the evolving threat of great power competition and hostile state activity occurring at the threshold below large-scale conflict, commonly referred to as the gray zone, is perplexing military planners. They are struggling to design structure and plans to contend with both of these dynamics. The challenge of the first problem of Brexit and COVID-19 will certainly amplify fiscal challenges and limit choice at a time of strategic uncertainty. As we all know, threats are evolving, pushing the limits of international rule sets, geography, and attribution. Competitor nations have been pursuing modes of fighting to gain an asymmetric advantage. The past two decades, we have been preoccupied with counterterrorism in irregular warfare. Meanwhile, Russia and China have continued their pursuit of a different warfighting concept to defeat the West. Beginning with Russia, on the left side of the slide, they have been working on reconnaissance strike complexes since it was the Soviet Union as early as the 80s and the 90s, but it wasn't until 2014 in the Ukraine that a noticeable change and capabilities showed that they were able to detect, target, and strike targets with remarkable speed. To Russian military thinking, artillery is a maneuver element whose destructive capabilities may perform ground-gaining missions. And make no mistake, Russia's military modernization has the explicit purpose of rendering NATO incapable of projecting combat power. You can see on the slide snapshots of their strike complexes using unmanned systems as well as their integrated fire control systems. On the right-hand side of the slide, you have China, the People's Liberation Army approach to training, organizing, and equipping for modern warfare over the past two decades has been thoroughly influenced by the system's thinking. They have shifted their view of modern warfare from opposing armies of mass attrition to war that is more competition of opposing operational systems. They have called this system destruction warfare. Like the Russians, the Chinese aim to disrupt paralyze and destroy the capability of the U.S. operational system, our battle network. And that leads me to my next slide. This is what I propose as strategic lethality. We need to better connect sensors to shooters in our alliance. They need to be layered by echelon and highly integrated into our battle network. We need to create multinational strike complexes that are fast and lethal ready to punish those who choose to cross the line of departure, challenging the sovereignty and resolve of our allies and partners. This slide depicts an illustrative concept showing the flags in NATO, but applies on the Korean Peninsula as well as any other theater where we have partners and allies. In NATO, we are lacking armored reconnaissance platforms with a reach, scale, and punch to properly deter and, if necessarily, constrain adversarial actions in the contact layer of the operating environment. Some may believe this can be mitigated by air platforms alone, but the air defense networks and their layers of integration make this an all-domain fight. Our formations need to operate with, with increased reach and dispersion in a fast-paced environment. They need the ability to collect on information requirements to support the deep fight, probe enemy gaps, and if needed, strike hard and fast destroying as much enemy as possible with minimal friendly economy of force. This requires all components of NATO to find windows of opportunity to exploit for convergence. NATO needs highly integrated formations at the forward edge of future battlefields to exploit these opportunities. All of our multinational forces need to feed into our battle network to make our kill chain faster and more lethal. It must be rapid and decisive to punish and deter would be adversaries. This begins with integrating them into our battle network. It needs to become a priority for all of us. The network architecture must be the principal system in which all our equipment must plug into, taking a systems as whole approach. This must include our NATO's allies and partners. 
As for intelligence systems, many of our nations are building an enhanced array of radars, drones, and other sensor platforms that need to be integrated. The data that comes from those systems needs to be streamlined and integrated to enable agile C2 on the battlefield. This must be an intellectual vector of travel as we continue to think about multi-domain operations and all domain warfighting. We can't leave behind our partners and allies. They're essential for modern deterrence and provide a competitive advantage our adversaries do not have. And this is why multinational interoperability is so important. Broadly speaking, multinational interoperability is critical to the success of combined multinational operations. However, this problem is twofold. First, there are complexities of interoperability. This includes the collective ability and capacity to rapidly coalesce an alliance of forces spanning multiple echelons and across multiple domains in a highly dense digital environment. We, along with our allies, must be digitally aligned across all echelons and warfighting functions using a common set of tools with redundant, uninterrupted communications. To put it simply, we must be networked. An unnetworked headquarters confronting 21st century multi-domain adversaries it's the same as sending a soldier to a battle without a weapon. Earlier this year, in Defender 20, we uncovered significant hurdles associated with federating national systems under U.S. command and control. This would have prevented the unity of command. To avoid this, we must critically analyze both our capabilities and limitations. Second, we must appreciate critical shortfalls across multiple warfighting functions where we currently lack capacity or our partners are, are insufficiently manned to perform specified warfighting tasks in a 24-7 environment. Obviously in NATO, this is not a given and we need to help our partners work through these challenges. This is why interoperability matters at all levels. Interoperability needs to be more than just a buzzword. NATO describes three dimensions of joint and allied interoperability as technical, procedural, and human. There is an emphasis on the need to operate with coherence to achieve a common objective. As you can see from this photo from Warfighter 194 at Fort Hood, Texas, we are doing this between our armies. But every time we do so, we come to realize we don't do it often enough and not at all the necessary levels. In the next slide, I'll talk about some myths of interoperability. There are several myths commonly associated with multinational interoperability, and I've listed most of the common ones on the slide. The first, myth one. The U.S. can fix this alone is indeed the most challenging. On one hand, interoperability is and should be a shared responsibility. On the other hand, we now prosecute warfare requires a high level of automation and digitalization, which our partners may not be prepared, manned, or funded to fully execute. Myth two, we cannot just assume things will work the way they did in Afghanistan. And if you serve there, and remember, this took a Herculean effort to get it right. We had to employ expensive contractors and buy loads of equipment. The Mission Partner Environment, or the MP, is coming online in Europe and in Pacific, but is not as robust as today as we knew the Centrix once was. Myth three, obviously during a crisis or a NATO declaration of Article five, we will open up bridges and tear down firewalls, but it's important to test the limits of the network interoperability, and explore the extent to which we can fully integrate now rather than wait for a crisis to dictate the extent of sharing and openness required. The old adage, train as you fight, is just as true for 21st century operations and perhaps even more so today. Myth four, it's a G6 issue. Interoperability stretches across all, all warfighting functions and is integral to the success of mission command. It absolutely requires command emphasis and full staff implementation. Myth five, we can use the 4G network. A consequence of increasing cost of technological advantage is requirement to maintain uninterrupted networks. The misperception is strong, and some may think that we can just merge into a 4G network. Of course, the threat of competitors are there, and we cannot roll out large-scale denial of such services or guarantee the security. Lastly, is often jokingly said in the UK that we are divided by a common language. Full interoperability includes a full understanding of doctrinal language. It is important to define terms which may mean different things for our partners and allies. For example, OPCON, ADCON, and Durloff 
don't mean the same thing across all formations. Looking more specifically at NATO, the member states have contributed to the development of 10 High Readiness Force Land Corps headquarters across Europe. Although NATO's core warfighting doctrine and interoperability processes are presently being developed by both the ARC and LANCOM, it remains unclear how exactly allied tactical formations might fully network in with U.S. counterparts during time of crisis. There also is a divergence of thinking on interoperability within NATO, as depicted by these bullets. Interoperability advances have been made in other theaters such as between the U.S. Forces Korea and the Republic of Korean Army from a technical and procedural standpoint. However, we have not fully implemented an Army-wide solution and approach that addresses all warfighting functions. An opportunity exists to share best practices across ASCCs and COCOMs, ensuring our partners can tie into U.S. formations as reliable combat partners. There is no NATO-wide concept for operations for technical interoperability establishing clear, specific guidance. And further complicating this is that a diverse landscape of national, regional, and international institutions spanning large agencies and respected law enforcement and intelligence services. Despite our progress with multinational interoperability, there is work to do in several areas. As the U.S. Army moves towards increasing its networked capabilities for multi-domain operations, a significant number of gaps remain in the area of interoperable, multinational teaming. Many of these exist between partner nations and cannot be resolved simply by employing U.S. joint or DOD-only capabilities. I would like to highlight a few from the list highlighted in bold. All of these are critical for effective combined armed combat operations with our partners and allies. Cross-domain communications will remain a problem for the foreseeable future. This includes the need to automate vast troves of data across multiple warfighting functions and mission command systems. U.S. commanders will need to be aware of what data solutions are critical and drive complete integration. At present, there are large gaps when it comes to standardization of data fields and formats between NATO and the U.S. Army. This includes vastly different methods for storing or presenting data. While this may not sound important to a warfighter, it is important to keep in mind that our ideal interoperability objective to speed the kill chain requires greater integration of partner units and their sensors and shooters to seamlessly share operational intelligence and near-time real information. Third, I mentioned battle damage assessments. BDA, given its reassess function in the targeting kill chain, how do we do this with our partners? We need to collectively work on this. And this leads me to my next slide of potential solutions. Fortunately, we are not facing an unsolvable problem. Over the course of the last year, the ARC has identified a number of potential solutions which suggest broad implications for the wider alliance. We see several near-term tangible solutions from Europe Defender 20, which improve warfighting in support of intermediate U.S. to partner integration. First, we recognize that in many cases, U.S. to NATO or U.S. to allied partner integration is challenged without substantial CIS or communications augmentation. In this regard, we have developed the best practice of integrating digital liaison detachments that are purpose-built and tailorable, bringing required cross-domain solutions. We may also consider that a commitment to a single common network architecture, such as the Mission Partner Environment, or the MPE, is in fact a viable go-to-war solution. It places all units on a common network, streamlining services, reducing interoperability challenges, and reduces the need for swivel chair manual inputs that are often seen. Again, I want to highlight the prominence of their C2 networks. The battle network will remain a top priority as we see centrality in the fight for information. In Australia, for example, the network architecture is the principal system in which all equipment must plug into, taking a systems-as-whole approach. Modern-day kill chains and strike complexes must be organized across the entire enterprise and require immediate interoperable logistics communications and manned and unmanned intelligence systems. Multinational units need the ability to dock in to our battle networks. 
Lastly, we can test our concepts now. We can outfit an attached headquarters with discrete systems and provide them in advance training prior to real world exercises or missions. Lieutenant General Cavoli in the United States Army Europe has been proactive in helping units make this happen across NATO. Europe Defender 21 is the next operational venue for more collaborative action and experimentation in this arena to occur. And to reiterate, it is essential that we enable partnered units to function seamlessly with our operational headquarters, pushing everyone to achieve a higher level of interoperability. This is so we can speed our kill chain to prosecute targets with intense violence and precision in time of conflict. As for testing things now, this leads me to my final slide. Here in the United Kingdom at the ARC, one of our Army U.S. strategists has worked closely with other British officers to create a fight club. This is a bottom-up initiative that has brought together industry partners, world-leading gaming companies, and both civilian and military leaders to use a variety of gaming techniques to challenge thinking and concepts. I have kept a close eye on this effort to help get the support it needs. Of note, and related to this presentation, they are working closely with the Director of Capability to experiment with autonomous systems and speed our allied kill chains. As you can see from the slide, they have a number of activities, and only in five months, they have a network of over 400 plus participants spanning five different NATO countries. A group of diverse talent and skills across all warfighting functions and joint services. This illustration in the middle of the slide shows conceptually what they're trying to achieve by testing and integrating multiple different manual and digital games. They're taking a mixed method approach to stress testing ideas and concepts. They have an ambitious goal of leveraging the data of the games to spin out AI applications that will improve the way we learn and fight. This is an exciting project. It will surely produce capabilities that will allow the Alliance Network to collaborate more often to test, challenge, and improve our thinking especially how we might integrate our sensor-to-shooter networks. It is our younger leaders who will figure this out, and senior leaders who continue to create space for innovation and good ideas for like this to flourish. That brings me to my final point about strategic lethality and improving multinational interoperability. As described throughout this presentation, our battlefields will be fast-paced and saturated with sensors. Our warfighters will face the challenge of integrating more and more systems to speed the kill chain. Our warfighters must be integrators, battlefield symphony conductors, bringing a harmony of intense violence to bear against those who wish to challenge our resolve. Our collective deterrence is undergirded by our ability to assemble and fight with hard power as an alliance. A decline of perceived vulnerability in our capability invites adversaries to test our mettle. We must have an alliance of warfighters who are at the very best at war to deter it from ever happening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I look forward to your questions. Sir, this is Colonel Chris Budas, the Chief of Staff at MCO. How do you read the station? Hey, Chris, I've got you uh, loud and clear. All right, sir, thank you very much. I'll be uh, facilitating the question and answer period here. Sir, uh, the first question for the field is the following. Sir, we have a number of officers here at the Maneuvers Captain Career Course. How can they prepare themselves professionally and personally to operate with partners to speed the Alliance kill chain, as you have mentioned? I think, uh, Chris, that's a great question. From the tactical level, particularly those, those young officers at uh, A. Bullock or, or the Career Course, as they go forward, their piece of this is uh, less technical in more human operability procedural as they work with partners, particularly here, as they come over for Atlantic Resolve. Um, the, the keys are integrating those partners. A lot of, a lot of the leaders down there as they come over from Atlantic Resolve into Europe, into the Baltics or into the Black Sea region, are going to find themselves task organized uh, with platoons and companies underneath them. And the key is, on that level, one is the human operability of, of learning our alliance and learning what their capabilities are and to some extent uh, their challenges. But the second part of that is the procedural. The technical piece of this, which I'd like to highlight for them, is you know, how do you get that blue red picture? 
how do we see our icons? How do we see friendly icons and prevent stuff like fratricide and deconfliction on the battlefield? There is bottom up solutions here uh, that are being achieved uh, right now in Poland uh, uh, with Atlantic Resolve Forces over there and down in the uh, down in the Black Sea region. But what I need to, to, the junior leaders need to do is when they get into these theaters is ask the hard questions of their battle of their battalion level commanders, and brigade commanders of forcing this technical interoperability and how we move forward. Over. Sir, thank you very much. Sir, the next question, we got a lot of questions related to interoperability of the digital network. Um, one of the questions is, in 2015, Atlantic Resolve exercise series identified two major issues between the US and European partners, which was the exchange of intelligence and uh, communications equipment interoperability. Have we collectively gotten better? And if so, how and where? So let me, let me start off. Uh, those, those, those challenges have not gotten much better, uh, particularly on the Intel side. I mean, a lot of stuff is, uh, it's, it comes down to TS. Uh, it's very hard to exchange that information um, and, and get cross domain solutions for this. Um, I, I can tell you right now in USER, what we're trying to use uh, as a method to move this forward is the Defender series of exercises. Um, a lot of the Defender stuff uh, on the live, particularly live X, was executed this year. Uh, and those were training objectives, particularly up in the wet gap crossings up in Poland that 1st Cav Division did with 12th Polish Mechanized Division. How do we exchange the red pitcher? How do we get SEC rel? Some of this was uh, done using mission partnered environment and, sh and exchanging a tip and a pop in that. So there has been some progress done on that. I'll tell you probably the biggest weakness we have right now is when you go TS. And a lot of that, uh, the, 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 the regulations and the laws that go behind that uh, make that information very hard uh, to give to our allies and partners. That's something we're gonna have to begin to work through. Uh, the next Defender series of exercises, Defender 21, is focused on the Black Sea region. Uh, multinational Force Southeast will be down there with a lot of tactical units from the U.S. Army. And uh, we're gonna continue to experiment and, and, and try to see, achieve some of these uh, issues. Over. Thank you, sir. The next question uh, from the field is the following. Are the size and scope of our current European exercises adequately preparing the U.S. and partners to conduct large-scale combat operations against uh, near-peer threat, I a.k.a. Russia? Okay, um, so this has been recognized. Up till this year, they probably had not been. So this year in Defenders uh, tw Series 20 that came into Europe, for the first time, uh, we were going to ex execute a CJ flick USER headquarters as a CJ flick with two NATO cores underneath it um, in a full CPX mode uh, under the joint warfighting uh, uh, assessment out of Army Futures Command. This is the goal for General Kovoli. Uh, we're going to do it again this year in Defender 21. The CPX portion, unfortunately, that was one of the casualties of COVID. And we lost an opportunity here. But the idea here is that we start integrating the NATO cores on a regular basis into every series of exercise, starting with Defender 20 out to Defender 24. This is new. Uh, there's some uncomfortableness, I'll tell you, amongst allies and partners of, of putting these cores into, into the CPX environment, which is very different from a NATO preval, uh, but it is the way ahead. It's, it's, it's only putting that stress that, that the U.S. can create in a training environment uh, that's, really gonna, that's really gonna teach large-scale warfighting to our, our partners. A lot of them can't create the synthetic environment to do that. That's, that's a large issue here. That's what the United States Army Europe brings. Uh, that's what we bring with War Sim. Uh, but that's how we're going to get after these solutions. Over. Yes, sir. Sir, next question from the field. And you mentioned the digital liaison teams. Uh, what forces or enablers does the U.S. need to consider building or increasing in capacity in order to support such a uh, uh, coalition fight? So, first of all, uh, our DLDs, uh, they reside in the National Guard. They are doing an incredible job. I've worked with, the, I've directly worked with DLDs when I was a DCG for three UK division, and they came over and were part of 194 Warfighter. We couldn't have achieved our interoperability objectives without that DLD. The issues uh, with the DLDs is some of them are going to, they, they all don't look alike. Uh, there's ones that support the Republic of Korea and the ones that support Europe and other places that are almost going to have to be bespoke. They're going to have to be built for purpose. 
they also need to they also need to contain all the mission command systems that you would need to jdoc uh taste amdus uh they all don't have these systems those are the critical mission uh command systems that we're going to have to proliferate into our allied partners our nato partners to get the air picture we need to deconflict the fires um great work done by the dld they're highly successful i would say uh they probably we need to relook their mtos and make sure they're filled exactly all the kit they need we're moving a lot of kit around if we go in the high scale uh, uh large scale combat operations we're going to need we're going to need many dlds in order to, to proliferate down these nato cores but they are a critical bridging stone but that's what they are too as a bridge and uh, what we really need to do is focus on a common network and i would i would i am a big supporter of the mission partner environment uh, where we bring everybody on the one network and we're able to trade a kip and a pop out of that. Uh, that's that's a growth uh, going on here in USER. I know it's being used in USAPAC too, uh, but those are the other ways to get after that issue. So thanks. Over. Thank you, sir. So our next question is, has Section 333 made a marked improvement in interoperability with our European partners? Yeah, if you could elaborate on that, Section 333, are you talking NATO standard? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir, in, in a, in a uh, uh, FMS specifically. Yeah, so um, is it having an effect? Yes, it is. Uh, but it's, it's like anything, this is iterative. I think the challenge of that going forward, uh, when you're taking it back to interoperability and lethality, is uh, as a, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the current environment I'm describing over here. You know, uh, COVID, Brexit, uh, fiscal. There's going to be a lot of fiscal challenges over here, as there will be in the states on where is the, where is the balance of investment, and I think that's what's going to be one of the challenges to that. Thank you, sir. So our next question from the field is the following, and you kind of spoke to it a little bit uh, during during the presentation. How do we stop our adversaries from getting an asymmetric advantage in the contact layer? And where might we find ourselves fighting out of position? And what are some of those challenges, sir? Um, well, the challenges are is that uh, you know Russian interference and influence uh, is going on uh, throughout Western Europe, and uh, it, it, it is recognized by all our NATO partners, particularly the, those 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 that operate in those forward layers uh, down in the Black Sea and the Baltics over in Poland. Um, what are the solution sets for this? A couple of them will be brought in the USER right now. The entrance of the multi-domain task force, the entrance of 41st Fires Brigade, you know, are, they bring capabilities in here uh, uh, to operate in those places. I'll tell you also, in the British Army, uh, they've created and stood up 6th Division, which is, which is tuned in to operate specifically in that environment that's been created in the British Field Army. Uh, it's fully operational today. So our partners are getting after this from different ways. Uh, the United States Army Europe, as it modernizes and, and, and advances, is getting the formations and the structures to go in there and, and operate in that environment. Over. So as you mentioned, so th this uh, this upcoming year we'll have uh, Defender 2021. Uh, uh, as you take a look with potential COVID, any impacts? Is there an idea if we cannot do it uh, via field to do it uh, virtual at some capacity? So, Chris, uh, that's a great question. Whoever asked, I will tell you this: um, I'm with General Cavoli right now, and all the senior leaders at USER, uh, we're together. Uh, we're mapping out uh, this next year, uh, particularly focused on we know COVID's going to be here, uh, unless there's a vaccine that comes out. It'll be here. We will not, Defender 21 uh, will not be a casualty of COVID as the JWACPX was. It is going to happen. I think what Euster demonstrated this summer with the wet gap crossing with 1st Cavalry Division up in, up in uh, up at the DPTA and, and later on uh, as we brought forces to the draw APS as late as August is, is that we've learned how to navigate through this environment. A lot of it is done with a lot of testing. Uh, in a lot of isolation of, of, of forces that go and train. Those procedures are being put in. So the Fender 21, uh, the CPX happens. It's gonna be a very, very important CPX. 
Uh, we're going to be experimenting. It will be the first rollout of NATO's newest core. That's multinational Corps Southeast, headquartered out of Bucharest. Um, they will be tied in with Fifth Corps as Fifth Corps comes online. General Kolchevsky is down here with us right now. So this is going to be a large CPX. The two things we're trying to get out of the CPX is multinational interoperability, particularly speeding those kill chains. But I can, I can assure you this. I, there is a plan going forward. That CPX and that LiveX, uh, as swift response goes into that, is going to happen. And it's going to happen through May through June of this year. Now, of course, the Fender series changes theaters every year. The focus will be Defender 21 will be in the Pacific. However, Defender 21 in Europe uh, has been planned, and it, it, it will happen over Sir, thank you very much for your presentation. Any uh, final remarks? Uh, no, I mean, my, my only closing comment would be, first of all, thanks for the Maneuver Center of Excellence uh, for putting this on. Thanks for the invitation to speak. You know, we we are only going to go forward with our with our, our NATO partners or any theater we're going in. We have to continue uh, to build that interoperability, to build those relationships uh, with our partners. It may be more key now than ever, particularly as the operational environment changes. But I thank uh, everybody for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I look forward to hearing your questions. If you if you want to reach out to me on email and, and I will follow up with it. Thanks for the time, Chris. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, for all of our teammates out there, uh, for the group, a reminder, you have to back out of this session and uh, click into the Lieutenant General uh, James presentation. We will take a 10 minute break at this time. Thank you, sir.